everybody. Today, uh, the speaker is, is uh, Jurek Kowalski Glickman, one of the organizers, but organizers has, have also a right to, to speak sometimes. And the title is very, very mysterious, uh, but <laughs> we have promised the promise of speaker that he will explain what is in the title. So yes, I will explain the, the yeah, I will actually spend the whole seminar explaining what's in the title. Uh, mm, this is based on the work with, that we are doing currently with uh, Remigiusz Durka, and it actually does some bits of pieces of some work that we did uh, well, 10 years ago or something. Uh, but uh, it's also based in a sense, uh, well, okay, before I, I, I start telling you what it's based on, I would just need to confess that I'm in a very similar situation. Uh, Jacek was last week, a uh, couple of weeks ago, actually, uh, with his seminar. I really was all uh, oh, when I booked this this uh, you know today for my seminar. I was per, uh, I was really almost certain that I, uh, that I would finish my you know writing the, the the paper, and I would understand everything I I needed to or I wanted to, but unfortunately, uh, uh, unfortunately I didn't. So there is many. I I, I still have many problems with with what I'm going to say and then and therefore I would really appreciate uh, your uh, your uh, posing questions asking questions uh, even if I might not be able to you know to answer them okay so uh, let me start with the with the literature uh, and there is, well, you know, we, we, we try to contribute to, to, the, to the research program that Laurent Fredel with, with various collaborators actually started, uh, I think, oh, almost 10 years ago. The, the first important, the first paper, which is relevant, there were some papers in which he, he was interested in the local, in the local, uh, in the local subsystems and gravity and thermodynamics and stuff. Uh, I don't uh, I don't mention them here, but you can easily dig them up. The first paper was one with Donnelly, uh, written in Donnelly five years ago about lo so local subsystems engaged during gravity, which actually set up the program. Then there was the last year there was a series of three papers written with uh, written with uh, Mark Geller and uh, Daniele Pranzetti. Daniele Pranzetti was actually uh told us something about this paper and that about this research project in the fall last year and there was also this uh, mm, uh this loop quantum gravity international seminar uh more or less the same time by mark giller about the series of these three papers and you can actually at least the, the one by by mark is actually available so if, if you're interested you can uh you can watch it there is uh, and to, in this series of uh, the, the, the most recent paper in this series of investigations is the one again with Donnelly and Laurent uh, and some some uh, some other collaborators uh, about which also belong. I, I will I will actually explain what what it's what this last paper is about uh, when I came to the point in the in my talk. Uh, so that's the literature. And what I would like to do, I, I would like to spend some time uh, just sharing with you some of my intuitions. So they are not really uh, they are not really formalized, but I think that they're good guiding principle to to what uh, to what I'm gonna to what I, I I'm going to do. Well, the first intuition is the willard devitt equation. And well, you know, it's almost 60 years now well, since this equation was actually formalized or postulated by Willer and, uh, and De Witt. Uh, this is a functional, this is kind of a very complicated nonlinear functional equation uh, for the something for the for, for psi, which is something like, well, you can be interpreted as a wave function of the universe. It depends. Is the the the, the para, well the, the the argument here is a three-dimensional metric. It's basically written in the you know in the in the in the framework of ADM of ADM formalism, and you know I mean 
most of the, it, it, well, but correct me if I'm wrong, but most of the investigations in the, most of the investigation is quantum gravity sense is actually, was actually about solving this equation. So one context or another and with one techniques or another, but uh, uh, there was at least a lot of investigations in the, in the last 60 years uh, in which people try to solve this equation. Uh, usually actually doing that in the, on a compact manifold without boundaries. There are some, of course, that there is, you know, that there is the, there is a kind of, uh, you, you can simplify this equation uh, using some mini superspace approximation and then try to investigate what this equation means and how to solve it in the context of, uh, of quantum cosmology. But, but what is actually, or you can try even, I mean, we tried with Krzysztof Meissner, we tried to solve it, solve this equation as it is, and we find some solution also in the case of loop quantum gravity. There is plenty of solution of this, of, of this equation, I mean, in, in, a, in a loop quantum gravity form, but, but still it's a solution of the quantum Hamiltonian constraint. Uh, still, uh, well, in most cases, the solutions are actually the, the people were interested in the case in which we have the, the special manifold is a compact manifold without boundaries. And it is hoped that after finding solution of this equation, some class of solutions, uh, which would describe, well, the, the, you know, the wave function of the universe, one would be able to understand the quantum nature of gravity. Jurek, Jurek. could you okay, remind hello. what is capital G? G is a, G is a, something called Willer David metric. It's a kind of it's something like a, a H A B H C D with some yeah. uh, with, with some uh, with some combination yeah, with some. It's a super. It's a called, called super. I mean, Willer calls it super space metric. No, to is to is metric, po prostu. No. Ale na metrykach, tak? Metryka na, yeah, this tak. is a metric on the space of metrics, yes. And this is something like, so G, A, B, C, D is something like H, A, B, H, C, D plus some additional, plus some three additional terms mm -hmm. with, you know, with, uh, with, uh, with indices permuted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, or, I, I, I'm sorry, but, but well, uh, you know, it, it it doesn't really it's not really relevant for what I'm going to say later. So I, I I'm sorry I didn't make the I didn't make the the kind of explicit expression for G. But think about it as a metric on a, on a space of metrics on three dimensional compact manifold. Okay. Right. So let me let me go to the next slide. Then. But, but then the problem is that uh, that uh, is uh, the, the problem is how to extract information from such a wave function of the universe, physical information, right? It, if this psi describes the universe, you know, the compact universe like this, like surface of this sphere, then 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 what is the meaning of this? Okay, how how you can make any measurements? What we can actually learn about it, and then. You know that, that then people started thinking about uh, the uh, uh, that this wave function may contain some relational, some relational information about the system. So that means that that we, so it contains information about the relation between some subsystems of the whole of the whole system. But then the picture is so. So basically, the picture is that I have the wave function of the universe. I uh, uh, I, from this universe, in this universe, I defined a, some subsystem, which I call the observer, right? Our civilization, you know, uh, with some instrument looking at the rest of the universe. And then, well, you know, the, 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 relational, inform the, the relational information be between the observer and the rest of the universe actually are related to the real observation that we are making. Can I make a comment? Sure, you can make, but let, let me finish the sentence and then, then you make a comment, all right? Uh, so, but then if, if, you, if you think a little bit about it, then, 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 then you realize that the, 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 the real, that, uh, that, that what you really, the situation that you really have here is that you have uh, two systems with the boundary between them and 
the observer observing the rest of the universe uses kind of a boundary degrees of freedom. So degrees of freedoms you can observe on the boundary between these two systems to extract information about the rest of the universe. Uh, yes, Jure, please. Yes, so when we, when we consider uh, uh, states of, of some in quantum mechanics, then they are represented by functions, but we know that depending on what measure we use, whether we, the, the measure is just the, 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 the Lebesgue integral dx, or, or if there is some Gaussian measure, then the shape of this function completely changes. So, so in fact, I would say that that, that, uh, that function a uh, solution to this equation contains zero information yeah. be, because what we need, we need, uh, we need observables. We need some tool yeah. to, and, and, and expectation values. So we need tools mm -hmm. which allow us to, to assign yeah. expectation values to observables. And no, yeah, I, I perfectly agree with you. This was precisely my uh, remark, which I wanted to make that without knowing uh, how the Hilbert space looks like, the information contained in the, in merely the function is, does not contain any physically valuable um, uh, information. That, that, that's of course perfectly right. Uh, and I perfectly agree with you, but with this comment and this intuition is on the lower, is kind of the lower level. I mean, uh, than that, I, in order to make any information in the closed universe, you need to separate within, the, if, the uni, if this closed universe is everything there is, so you cannot look at it from outside, you need to separate this universe into, this, into observer and of the observed. And there is no way, I mean, th th this is just a basic physical intuition what, what, you, uh, what you must do, because otherwise you cannot really extract no info, any information. Of course, I agree, I agree with you. I agree, but uh, why the universe must be, uh, in this case, why the universe must be uh, closed? In, in any case, uh, you, uh, uh, yeah, that, that's 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 of course right. But if the universe is not closed, then uh, we have uh, we have a situation in which at least uh, you have some kind of a boundary at infinity. Yes, and. What I'm argue, what I want to argue is that even if you really choose to start with the theory which is defined on the which is defined on the compact manifold without, I mean, spatial compact manifold without boundaries. Nevertheless, if you want to extract any interesting physical information from the system, you really need to introduce the boundary between observer and the observer. <laughs> Uh, uh, in order to get some, to extract some information. That's the, that's- Yes, yes, of course, I agree. So, so that, that's, a, that's a very trivial and simple message I want to, I want to make because at the end of the day, my, uh, my, my point is going to be that one way or another, we really must be inter really interested in the system with boundaries. Yes, of course. Uh, yes, excuse me. Yes. Uh, do you need uh, this to, uh, let's say uh, subsystems uh, being not, not coupled. Well, they, they must be coupled, of course. Ah, they must if, be the, coupled. if the systems are not coupled, then there is no information that we can extract. Uh, uh, then we can extract uh, uh, from from the other from the other part of the universe. They are, they if are you have constraint, if you have constraint, this constraint can couple somehow in a sense these two systems. Oh yeah, the, yeah. Of course, that's right. The the problem is how actually to do that. One way or another, you really need you really need to. Uh, okay, so so let me go ahead. Uh, this is uh, this is just an intuition. So I, I don't want to spend too much time on you know discussing this because it's uh, because there are some more intuitions and I will get, just give you the final picture. I think it's worth considering, and then I will go to technical details. So uh, please let me continue. All right. Another intuition, another intuition is something that that is this. This is something. This is kind of a successful story, uh, which uh, you may like, you may like, or you may not like. You may think it's completely unphysical, uh, but nevertheless, it exists. So I think it should be it should be really taken seriously. Well, the ADS CFT conjecture poses that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between quantum gravity in the bulk 
in particular of a particular space time and the quantum conformal field theory on asymptotic boundary. That's what it says. I mean, it's, uh, 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 it's, it's not completely clear if the, I mean, there is, if, as far as I understand, there is no precise proof that this is, this is just a conjecture, that's not a theorem, but still it actually tells you something interesting. It tells you that you can actually, that given the boundary data, you can reconstruct something which is, uh, which is in the bulk. And then the natural question is, I mean, in ADS CFT case, we have this asymptotic boundary. And then the question is, what about if I don't have, you know, the, the, the default uh, uh, asymptotic IDS space time, but if I have a, a kind of a region with finite, with, with finite boundary, is there any way that we can actually uh, uh, learn from the boundary data that we can learn uh, about the bulk degrees of freedom? or isn't, or what, to which extent. And this is also related to this observed stuff, because if I have this boundary separating the observed system and the observer, it would be nice to have some degrees of freedom on the boundary that would actually, uh, to some extent at least, let us extract information about the observed, about the observed system. Where, so where, did you, where did you steal this illustration from? Uh, I don't know. I, I just uh, I'm ask asking. It. I'm no, asking. No, no. I, I go just Google ADS CFT, and then I found the the, the the illustration that I found particularly nice. I see. Uh, Yesterday I watched a lecture by Roger, uh, in, and and he also was showing uh, the, the the upper part of this illustration. Okay. Well, so, so it's just Google. There is nothing. Nothing particularly. Uh, nothing particularly. Uh, uh, relevant about this, about I, I, it just pleased me, so so I actually use it. There is another intuition which I think it's actually for me it's kind of appealing. I this is an intuition. This is not really an analogy, and the intuition is about quantum field theory and the way we you actually the way you actually construct a perturbative quantum field theory. Uh, you know. Basically, the quantum field theory you can, you can think of perturbative quantum field theory as a, as a bunch of uh, Feynman diagram, and uh, and the Feynman diagram is essentially uh, the the the, form, the building block. There are two building blocks of Feynman diagram. There are lines, and they are uh, and there are vortices in which these lines meet. Well, if you look at the line, the line has actually share some, uh, it has some very funny structures. So what you have in the bulk, you basically have some, uh, some constraint. Well, at the, assuming that it's external line. So it, inside the line, you have a constraint operating, the Hamiltonian constraint, which is essentially the, you know, P squared equals M squared, the Marshall condition, but the, ends of the line are actually labeled by momentum and spin carried by the particle in question. And we know from Wigner that there are, you know, that the, 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 we can essentially represent all the elementary particles by the spin and by the spin and, uh, and, and, uh, and momentum. So basically this building block is actually if you think about bulk and the boundary, you will think that there is a Hamiltonian constraint in the in the bulk, and some representation of uh, representation of the relevant symmetry group, which is the Poincaré group at the boundary, which actually brings kind of an idea that perhaps something of the same of similar sort can be made actually can be made actually in quantum gravity, that. The basic building block of quantum gravity would be regions with Willard de Witt equation operating in the bulk and some boundary charges labeling the state and the boundary. Again, think about this observer. I, I, what, I really want to, what I really want to stress is that my intuition is that only the, the that the charges that we have on the boundaries are actually things that are observed from outside. We really don't have, I mean, as an outside observer, and this is a claim, I cannot, I don't really prove it uh, precisely, but this is what my intuition is telling me, 
that basically you have the, the only insight into what's happening into what's happening happening in the in the region is through the boundary degrees of freedom that we can that we can actually that we can actually somehow somehow measure. So this is the picture, and then here in this row, lower row, uh, right corner, you see you know kind of a gravitational Feynman diagram, which is essentially composed of this composed of the, of these bubbles so the in the case of a particle at the end of the line i have a momentum which i have can measure in the case of gravity the claim is i have some charges that again i can measure and then in the case of interacting quantum field theory the momenta that the ends of the world lines are actually meeting in the uh, uh, meet in the vertices there are some conservation equations that must be satisfied in order to that this, uh, these guys can actually can actually meet in the vertex. And my intuition is that perhaps something similar can be actually thought of in the case of quantum gravity, that first of all, these charges serve us as the uh, as a physical quantities that can be measured, and also that we can glue these bubbles into in, in the regions, into larger regions. Just by we using some kind of the some kind of well, let's say conservation equations, and also I mean coming back to, to this ADS CFT and the reconstructing gravity in the bulk quantum gravity in the bulk from from the conformal field theory on the boundary. Well, there is some and there are some new papers by Fredel and and this and, and the other guys, including Daniele Pranzetti and Simone Speciale, in which they actually put forward this kind of, uh, that they try to argue in, uh, well, I will not talk about that here, but that they try to argue that indeed there's bulk equations of motion in, and W uh, or Will and DeWitt equation can be actually understood as charge conservation equation uh, where the charges, you, you mean in, in case of the charges in the boundary. So these are my intuitions that I wanted to share and then I would like to tell you about the gauge theories and especially about BF theory. So returning to the question of Jacek Izierski, BF theory, we I consider as an example BF theory, and BF theory is actually the name is after the form of the Lagrange of the action. There is a B field, so it's customary to call this field B, and there is an F field, which is just a field strength for some connection. That's why BF. It's a pretty nice and pretty interesting uh, topological field theory, which is actually written in this way. You can check that this is topological field theory. It doesn't have any local degrees of freedom. Uh, at least if this manifold M is a closed manifold, compact without boundary. So let us see what's going on, uh, what's actually made, uh, what is the structure of this theory and what can uh, what really happening in this theory in the, with this theory if we have if we have boundary? Okay, this is the action. This is the field strength of the of the connection that can be any uh, you know that can can be any Lie algebra. So the connection might be a, basically any Lie um, <coughs> algebra valued uh, connection. Uh, precisely in the mathematical sense, this is. Uh, uh, this, of course, makes sense and can be and is analyzed for for compact uh, Lie algebras, but uh, we can extend it for non-compact one. Uh, of course, uh, having uh, again the, then the problem with uh, some formal divergences and stuff. Uh, but on, on the level of classical field theories, the, it, it doesn't really it is not really that relevant at this moment. Uh, it, you can easily see that there are two field equations following from. Uh, following from uh, from here, the first field equation, which is the field equation of B, forces F to be zero, which means that the connection that are, we are having the flat connections, and uh, and uh, and the uh, the field equation of A is a co uh, the the covariant derivative of B, covariant differential of B of two form B of, of uh, form B is equal to zero. In four dimensions, this is a two form B is also a two form. A dlaczego demo index A? Oh, it doesn't, it's not an index I, A, it's just the, 
This is the covariant derivative with of the connection. It's covariant differential of connection. Tak? Że D zależy od A, tak? Yes. 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 They just in jeszcze indeksy raz są na górze, raz na dole w tym B. To, to, to jest w dualnej algebrze wartości ma B niż F? Uh, is there anybody here who doesn't who doesn't understand who doesn't understand Polish? Because I I feel a little bit paranoid. Yes, like... yes, yes. There are foreigners in the. Sorry. So I I would like to ask the question first. Uh, what is A? And it is just D depends on A on the connection. Yes. It's a covariant derivative differential. Covariant derivative. Okay. But but the problem is that B is a, is a is a is a differential form. Yes. Yes. With values where with values R, with, with values in the algebra, algebra or, or dual. It doesn't really uh... matters. <laughs> <laughs> because you cannot raise indices easily. It yeah, is... well, no, uh, no, no. OK, I good. I, I assume, of course, that I have a metric. Usually this is a compact, a compact B group and there the is compact B group. I, I have a oh, yeah. metric. So so this oh, raising have, and lowering the indices is with is by but with the help of the killing metric on the on the algebra. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. Good. Now uh, let me let me now introduce the, the, the notion of symplectic potential. And I believe that Jacek will ask more uh, a lot of questions because he certainly knows more, more about it than I do. Uh, in general, when, when you take, make a variation of the Lagrangian or the variation or the variation of the action, but let, let's let's stick to the Lagrangian, the variation of the Lagrangian uh, is well, you know, I, I should say that this is after Walt and and uh, and uh, Jerzy Kioski, Ely paper and Chernkovich and Witten. I mean, there were lots and lots of people who actually contributed. I think that the first papers on this kind of covariant formalism. Uh, covariance symplectic formers was indeed in the paper of Schirber and Kioski in the 70s. So the basic structure, I'm not going to details, uh, but the basic structure is that if I take a variation of the Lagrangian, then generally the variation of the Lagrangian is something which is an equation of motion plus a total differential of something which I call theta. This is basically what we what we know from 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 this. So, so this is kind of a general formula. If I make a variation, it contains a term which is which are not the total derivative, and this we interpret as the uh, as the as the equation of motion and the total derivative of something that normally in the standard you know naive point of field theory you completely neglect. We say well there are some uh, in the compact. In the compact in the compact space, they, this this term vanishes, and if they if they are boundaries, well, okay, there are some boundary tests we don't we don't care. But actually, it turns out that there is a lot of interesting information carried by this. Uh, the presymplectic potential is defined as an integral of this theta over some surface sigma. And in the terms of, uh, in the terms, in, in the case of BF theory, you can easily compute that this, that, that this theta, this potential, symplectic potential, is actually uh, is actually given by the by this kind of a simple universal integral integral uh, integral, which um, actually uh, makes is used is used or we use it in our formulation, but also in in uh, in other formulation of gravity, like uh, you know, like in the Eisenkartan Holst formulation, to which I will refer later on, uh, the the potential we you, people started with is actually this one. Okay, so now let us try to see what's happening if I make a gauge transformation. The gauge transformation of connection is this one. Uh, and uh, well, actually, yes. Uh, so if I make a gauge transformation of the of this potential, I obtain the original term plus the term like this. You can do the calculation, and this is the result of calculating the gauge transformation. Uh, B is actually defined to transform homogeneously like a field strength, and then you can actually do the calculation. You end up with this with this expression 
And this expression actually, if you use equation of motion, so if you integrate by part, you know that dA acting on B is gives you zero. So this is the same equation of motion, but there is this total derivative that actually stays. So if there is a bound, if the surface sigma has have boundaries, uh, then the presence of boundaries make the symplectic potential not gauge invariant. And this is essentially the same thing happens in all gauge theories. If you have a gauge theory, uh, usually well, um, like young Niels theory, for example, again, you have exactly the same situation that if there is a boundary, then the, then the symplectic potential is not uh, is not is not gauge invariant, and now that, that this is not something that we like because that means well the symplectic potential essentially uh, is uh, essentially telling you what is the, the symplectic structure of the theory, what are the Poisson brackets and stuff, which means that uh, which means that that we don't really want the Poisson bracket of the of the young Niels theory to, to be gauge not invariant. Uh, and this, and, and there are several ways you can uh, several ways out of it. Well, the one way, which is is just to kill the unwanted terms in the sense that you just impose special boundary condition. For example, if I go back, for example, if I assume that field B on the boundary is zero, then then of course this boundary then vanishes. Or if I assume that the gauge transformation are such that they vanish at the boundary again, this term vanishes. So there's some way out, but we don't really want to do it because one of the one of the uh, one of the goals of this exercise, which I am going to 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 uh, to show you later, is that I want the gauge uh, this boundary to be completely arbitrary chosen. So really, I would like to split my space into regions with some with some bounded regions and get some information. So I don't really want to impose any boundary, any special boundary conditions on the on the on the boundaries because I want these boundaries to be completely arbitrary. Another thing to do is actually to add some fields on the boundaries so as to restore the so as to restore the gauge. Uh, the gauge symmetries and this this fields and the boundary are called generally edge terms. They appeared first in the in the solid state physics, but then they were actually uh, introduced in the case in the case of the field theory. I will not discuss the edge states here. I believe. No, no I, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Please. Uh, so usually, if if there is a boundary, then we by gauge transformations, we, we consider those gauge transformations which vanish on the boundary while yes. uh, while whatever happens on boundary becomes a symmetry rather than, than gauge transformation. That's uh, that's exactly right. And that's I, I will turn to this point. OK. So so you the, 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 they might you may choose some additional so some some fields on the boundary so as to so as to make the uh, that transform and the gauge transformation in a particular way, so as to so so as to remove this, uh, and so as to so so you kind of extend the phase space of the system, adding some degrees of freedom on the boundaries on, on the boundary, and then in such a, to do it in such a way so as to so as to make the the symplectic potential the symplectic potential to be uh, to be gauge invariant even in the case of the even in the case of the boundary. As, as I showed here. Okay, let me let me continue. Well, okay, so let me now give you a little bit. The, the, again, this is this is some this is already something that Jurek mentioned, and this is kind of a difficult subject and tricky and subtle. Uh, okay, so gauge invariant actually reflects redundancies in, in in the in our description of physical system. This is the this is kind of the of the way we think about gauge symmetries. Uh, they are just redundancies. Uh, the charges correspond to gauge invariances vanish, and they cannot be used to label states in quantum field theory. So, for example, you have in, in quantum gravity, right? You have a, in, in the bulk, you have the Hamiltonian constraints, which is uh, which is kind of a charge of the uh, associated with the form of his, uh, with the form of its invariance. It is forced to be zero, so it, you cannot really label any state with this. 
right? The Hamiltonian constraint is all on, on the on the wave function, whatever we, whichever we, the theory using actually it's annihilates the wave function. So it actually carries from the point of view of of information. You may say that this information is it doesn't really give you a lot, lot of information. On the other hand, we have physical symmetries like Poincaré symmetry in quantum field theory. And the symmetries, physical symmetries, do not have vanishing charges. Usually, the charges associated with physical symmetries form some non-trivial algebra. And we use the representation theory of these algebras as a principle to organize our Hilbert space. That's exactly what's happening in quantum field theory, right? We organize our Hilbert space by using representation theory of Poincaré group. Now, the point is that in the presence of boundaries, the gauge invariance in the bulk becomes a physical symmetry, a physical symmetry on the boundary. So it's the gauge symmetry is strictly speaking broken, but it's uh, but there are some charges, some conserved charges that actually are non-trivially uh, are non-trivial on the boundaries. They form a non-trivial algebra. And my believing is, although again I can, my intuition is that uh, although again I cannot really prove it, that these charges are essentially uh, carry for you the information that you can get about uh, about the system or labeling this the state. So in fact, these charges are the object that can be physically measured. The value can be physically measured. So for example, if you think about the you know about the ADM. So let me give you a gravitational example. If I have a boundary at infinity, we have, I mean, according to Teitelbaum and uh, and Rege, uh, and Rege, you we have some uh, charges at infinity, or like mass and angular momentum, and they are relevant because we believe that these charges can be actually physically measured. I mean, if I thinking about the black hole in the in the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, the, and I, then there is a way that I can actually say, well, the mass of this black hole is, I don't know, five solar masses, which is exactly an example of a measurement associated with asymptotic charge. So I believe that these charges, that, that, uh, that these gauge symmetries that become, uh, that become physical symmetry in the boundary, they, they, they have uh, charges associated with them, which actually correspond to things that have, can be physically measured and can be used, again, I return to this picture of observed and observer, can be used to characterize the system we, are, we, we want to observe. Okay, so now let me actually turn to this to the technical part of the this was kind of an introduction. So let me go to the technical part of the of the theory. I I believe I have about what 20 minutes to go, right? Mm, Jacek, is that 20 uh, minutes knows, that I have? Who knows how much? Uh, yeah, even more if you want. Even more if I want. Okay, so I will not speed up too much and uh, 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 and to uh, tell, uh, okay. So, so the action is, it contains four, three terms. This is the action that I am kind of obsessed with for the, you know, for, for many years. This, uh, I, I always find it, I, I find it extremely elegant form of the uh, gravitational, of the gravitational, uh, of, uh, of the gravitational action. It contains of it contains three pieces, as I said. The most relevant one, there are two, two relevant ones, and one which is you know which is uh, perhaps less relevant, but still there. The first piece is just the standard BF piece. There is F, which is a curvature. There is a curvature that this is a the connection which I'm having here is the connection of the SO32 or SO41 group or SO32, SO41 algebra, uh, anti the sitter and the sitter algebra. Uh, we're raising and lowering the indices with the metric eta, uh, eta ij, which is the, the, you know, the five dimensional metric. Uh, this, uh, uh, so, so this is the first term. The second term, which is uh, sometimes is called the cosmological term, but in the, the, this is misleading in this context. Certainly, so this is gauge invariant term. If okay, F transforms homogeneously under gauge transformations, B transforms homogeneously under gauge transformations. So this 
so this term is invariant. Then this term is also gauge invariant, so I can add it with some parameter beta. It will. Uh, it, it happens that this beta is really related to emits parameter. So it's, so so this term could be called a Barbero emits term. And there is an important term. I mean, if 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 the if the theory contains just these two terms, you can you check that this would be a topological theory with no dynamical degrees of freedom. But actually, the trick is to add the third uh, the third term, which breaks uh, in a sense breaks the uh, breaks the symmetry of the action down to the symmetry. Of uh, of the stability uh, or stability group of the of the particular vector Vm, which I will not fix at this moment. This is just a vector Vm, which is valued in algebra of SO3 to SO41, and which is normalized to be either minus one for one and to, and one for 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 uh, for another algebra. As you see, if I fix V, whatever way I fix it, if I fix V, this term actually breaks the symmetry down to, it can be easily checked. Uh, it really breaks the symmetry down to the stability group or stability subgroup of, the, of this vector Vm. So fixing V, it actually gives you, in both cases, fixing V in this way gives you, in both uh, cases, the symmetry algebra, so gauge symmetry algebra of this whole Lagrangian to be just a Lorentz group or the Lorentz algebra. That's the construction of the theory. Uh, then I can decompose the connection into connection that I called Lorentz connection, which is kind of orthogonal to V. And this kind of a combination in which, ca in which case this E is actually turns out to be nothing but the tetrad. Uh, let me now stop for a moment just to compare this construction with the standard einstein cartan holst uh, theory given in the uh, described in the in the kind of very similar in the very similar formalism. The einstein cartan holst Lagrangian is essentially can be expressed also in this in the in this form B, which R R is the R is the curvature of connection of the Lorentz connection omega, where B is uh, B is actually related to a tetrad by something that is called commonly the simplicity constraint. You actually want to ask something? You are missing the 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 host term in this host action. No, no, no. The host hmm? term comes exactly from. Oh, okay, gamma. because the host term is here in gamma. Okay, good, good. Sorry. So there is a host term there. Yeah, so the, the host term exactly in gamma, yes. And if you compare it with, uh, if you compare with, with, this, uh, with this BF action, which I called Friedel's molin Staradukse, although no, I, uh, so, so it's alphabetical, but it should be really smolin Staradukse's Friedel in the order of appearance. Uh, this action it looks pretty similar. So the first term is, it looks it has the same form, but remember the algebra is different and the connection A combines already both tetrad and omega. And there are some additional terms here that are not that are not, not present in the Einstein Cartan Hall function. There is no simplicity constraint here, which is kind of a, I, I always thought that it's, it's kind of a very good news that you really need to impose any a, any additional constraint from uh, from outside, although of course this you can add some uh, you know you can add some plebinsky like term here to uh, with some uh, Lagrange multiplier to impose this constraint. So the structure would be some pretty similar. Good. Now uh, then uh, if you actually expand the, uh, write this action of, of this uh, Friedel's uh, small and star uh, star of theory, uh you will find that this this action becomes just the standard einstein cartan holst action with addition of two uh two topological terms euler pontragi mimian so for the bulk it's actually that these two theories are completely equivalent because the euler or the, the topological terms do not change equations or the field equations on the other hand when we start having boundaries 
the, the, two, the we expect these two theories to uh, to differ from one another. So and the, in describing the system with boundaries, these two theories will probably give what we expect to give different, slightly different results. The field equations, well, the field equations are, uh, can be rewritten after some work, well, actually a lot of work can be written in the, can be written in this, in this form, uh, which from the first equation, it follows the torsion vanishes then if torsion vanishes, the second term in the second equation vanishes identically as a result of, as a result of Bianchi identity. And what remains is, is the term, is the first term, which is nothing but, you can choose, show easy, you can see easily that these are nothing but Einstein equations. So as I said, uh, uh, as for the bulk field equations, these two theory are completely equivalent. However, they differ in the case of the boundaries. So let, and since we, we are really interested in the boundaries, it's of interest really to investigate how they differ and what are, what are the, the boundary charges calculated from this uh, constraint BF theory. The symplectic potential. Well, the symplectic potential has this, has this, uh, has this standard form. Uh, which I already we, which I already showed you in the case of BF theory. This is the universal form. The and the difference between one theory and another uh, actually resides in the far in, in the in the expression for B. In the case of Einstein Hilbert calls uh, Einstein Cartan calls this B is nothing but is nothing but uh, uh, this E veg this simplicity can be can be actually uh, is given by simplicity constraints. In our case, actually, this B is given from field equations. And we find that this is actually, it has this uh, pretty uh, simple form. So B is proportional to F, to something which I call, called, call, well, the, the Lorentzian part of the, of, the, of the curvature. And uh, another part is the, uh, is the part of the curvature which is actually uh, which is actually proportional to torsion, so it's vanishing. So for the rest of the of what of what I'm going to say, we can just we can just think that B in this expression is nothing but the Lorentzian part of the curvature, which is expressed which is actually expressed here. Uh, okay. Now the symmetries of the action. Well, we would like to, to see what that the charges. So the, let, let me let me let me first start with the good with the gauge symmetry of the action. This is this action has two kinds of gauge symmetries. The first one are the uh, local anti is local anti density symmetry, which acts on the field and the background. We, well, we treat D as a background, and this uh, allows us to actually extend the, the symmetries of the action. To the to the to the whole anti density symmetry, but then you will see in a moment that this part, which is which is not Lorentz, this extension to anti this from Lorentz to anti density or this city actually is kind of trivial because uh, because it does not really reflect in the charges. So these are the transformations. Since the uh, this is the gauge symmetry, uh, this is how V transforms, and this is how <clears throat> and this is how B transforms, so I, as I told you, B transforms homogeneously. You can think of these transformations, uh, you know, V is a kind of a vector that is used here to split uh, the, the sitter or anti the sitter algebra into Lorentz part and the part which is kind of a, a translational part. And uh, the symmetry essentially is telling you uh, that by by using some uh, by using the by using some some part of the symmetry, I actually I can change I can change the split. You know the, the way you can the way you can embed Lorentz into uh, the sitter anti the sitter is not unique, of course, and it depends on the on the way how you actually uh, how you actually choose to to do the, the embedding. And actually, V essentially controls this this embedding. So boundary charges. Well, to compute the boundary charges, there is a very the kind of a magic formula, which I think is extremely beautiful. You start with a symplectic structure, 
And then you replace one of the, well, roughly speaking, if you have a symmetry, which, which is a kind of a transformation delta star, star labels the asymmetry that you're interested in, then essentially the charge is defined in a way that delta of the charge is this construction in the field space of this variations in the, on this variation in this field uh, of the symmetry with omega. This is a beautiful formula and, uh, and really kind of magical and it actually makes it very easy to, to compute the charges. And then for Lorentz symmetry or ADS symmetry, we find that the charge has the following structure. And then you calculate it, you integrate by part and you actually find that there is a bulk piece which is proportional to the covariant derivative of B, which vanishes by field equation, so it's irrelevant. And there is a, bound, uh, a, bound, uh, 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 a, a boundary S piece, and I will call, and now I should explain the title. Basically, my, the structure is that I have a surface sigma, think of it as a surface of constant time, which is my region which is bounded, so, so think about it as a kind of a ball, bounded by the kind of a sphere, this bubble, and this bubble, which I denote here as, I will, in the what follows, I will call the corner. So th this is for the, just to explain the, just to explain the terminology. And we learn, so what we learn, that if I actually try to find a charge, which is associated with this, uh, ADS symmetry of the system that I'm having here of my of my gravity theory, the only contribution to the charge is a charge is a actually contribution coming from the corner. You can simplify it even farther, and you find that so so if you split this if you split this transformation which is ADS transformation, SO32 or SO41 transformation into Lorentz part labeled by lambda and some kind of translational part labeled by zeta with this con additional conditions, then you find that the charge associated with zeta with the translational part is actually zero. As a result of some identities that you can, that you can put, this is basically the, the co consequence of Bianchi identity. What does it mean? That means that this part of the gauge symmetry, this translational part of the gauge symmetry is actually gauge symmetry even on the, in the presence of boundary. It's just trivially gauge, which means that without losing any physical information, we can actually gauge fix this part of the symmetry and I gauge fix it in the following way. So I fix just the vector. So it's a unit vector with one pointing in one direction and some orthogonal direction and which is zero in orthogonal directions, then this indices I are just indices in Lorentz. You can check that the indices in the, in the Lorentz uh, subalgebra of the original gauge algebra. And this simplifies a lot of the, this simplifies a lot of the, the expressions uh, that I'm going to, to use. In fact, we find that uh, the difference, uh, the difference now between the einstein coase theory and our approach is in using the gauge is that in our case, B is actually proportional to this curve, kind of a curvature, including cosmological constant called the de Sitter curvature with this proportional, with this kind of a, uh, with this kind of a term. And in the case of einstein cartan hilbert theory, einstein cartan holtz theory, B is expressed as a, uh, as a just a, a wedge product of two tetras. Well, since I don't have much time, let me actually, uh, let me actually just go to technicality, to more technicalities. Uh, here is simple, simple, we can co compute the symplectic potential, which has this, the following form. It contains the, Originally, it contains a bulk piece on sigma, and it contains some bound, uh, the, some corner piece, which is given in this way. However, it can be even it can be even simplified, or, or, or it can be worked out because we can actually 
see that one piece that is in the ball is essentially by using the torsion condition, the, the fact that torsion vanish is actually related to the total to the total differential. So at the end of the day, we have this form of the bulk uh, symplectic potential and kind of a pretty complicated symplectic potential uh, in the boundary at the corner, which looks like this. And this is kind of a pretty, which this is uh, the first thing that makes this, this theory uh, different than, uh, than the one which is based on Einstein Carton holes. The structure of the symplectic potential and the corner is different than in the case of Einstein Carton holes. The charges, well, the charges have a very kind of a pretty nice form. So this is the charges associated with Lorentz symmetry that are just proportional to the curvature. Uh, this kind of a uh, your, this kind of a generalized curvature in the presence of cosmological constant uh, multiplied by this factor, and this is the parameter of Lorentz transformation. And uh, the additional charges of the form office. The, for the charges of the form office, actually there is a comp there is a bulk term, but you, you you can easily see that the which is kind of pretty kind of a simple. But you see that this bulk term actually vanishes if there is if you consider the form office which are tan tangential to this surface sigma. And then. The only remaining part of the of the of the diffeomorphic charges is, the, uh, is again the diffeomorphic charge associated with the corner, which has kind of a form which is pretty similar. If you look here, if you look here, and here you see that if you replace psi contracted with omega with lambda, the form of the charges will the form of the charge will be completely will be completely identical. And actually it bothers me a little bit because I'm not really sure if you think, if you really need to, con if these two symmetries are indeed, I mean, if the charges of these two symmetries are indeed uh, independent of one another. Okay, uh, this is how it is in the, in the einstein carton theory. There is a kind of a puzzling difference between the two and I, I think it should be, it should be understood. Uh, the algebra, the algebra of charges is actually is pretty easy to is pretty easy to compute because this algebra of of Lorentz symmetries and the, and the form of it, so the full algebra so the full algebra essentially has the structure it is kind of a semi direct uh, semi 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 direct sum of, of these two of these two algebras uh, but I didn't have a symbol to to put this. Or semi-direct product of the of the groups. Uh, I didn't have a symbol to put to put it here, so this is kind of a um, uh, so so this is the, this is strictly speaking not not precise. But this is the, this is the standard algebra uh, uh, that that this charge is satisfied. And then it brings me to the summary of my talk, and I I I, uh, I speed up a little bit, but uh, so but I hope that you, you don't mind too much. Uh, so the, the basic the basic message I want to I want to uh, I want to make uh, here to stress to that this this point that I wanted to stress is that constraint BF theory leads to the same bulk equation as the Einstein Cartan of uh, host formalism, but the boundary behavior of these two theories is different. This is something to be investigated. To what extent it's different? Because the algebra. The algebra of this of charges is exactly the same. The question is, uh, do the difference are this difference relevant or not? Uh, what's important is that the symplectic potential contains a corner contribution which is not present in Albert Cartan holes, and this is something that we that I still don't understand. That we so we will will investigate. Uh, we'll still need to investigate. Uh, the charges are also different, although I, I must say that we actually, uh, in this work that we've done, I don't know, 10 years ago with Remigius, we actually computed some of the charges for some uh, simple solutions of tau, uh, of, uh, of Einstein, equa Einstein uh, equation in the presence of cosmological constant. So for we were considering asymptotically ADS spaces 
like, or swally, like uh, sword shield, care, and taub not. And we actually found that this, uh, the charges, which are exactly the charges that we compute here, actually give the right value of the, the correct value or ex physically expected value so that they really reproduce mass and speed and angular momentum and stuff. So it is again an open, open question of what would be the ramification of this fact in, in, in quantum theory, meaning if the quantum theory of, uh, of uh, einstein cartan holes is irreducibly different than quantum theory base, uh, which would be quantization of this, of this theory. Okay, I think that's, what, that's exactly what I wanted to say, and I hope I didn't spend too much time on it. So thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, questions? Who would like to ask? Uh, I have a comment because I am not sufficiently fast to follow all these calculations, but I would like to, to mention that in Einstein's theory, not just Einstein Cartan holes, even not Einstein Cartan, but just in the um, conventional Einstein theory. You mean the metric formulation? No, no matter whether it's metric or uh, or metric affine or affine, because they, these are just different formulations of the same theory. The, the theory is always the same. Uh, I have found the, the corner degrees of freedom, which I called corner degrees of freedom, just by carefully analyzing uh, the boundary terms in the variational formula. And uh, I have published it, I believe, 30 years ago or something like that. I don't know whether uh, those corner degrees of freedom are uh, have anything to do with your ones, but my first feeling is that they have, but maybe I am wrong. No, no, yes, certainly they have. Yes, of course, of course they have. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, I mean, mm, I, I, I think that, that, uh, that, that this whole program, I know it from Laurent and, and actually he also told you, I remember that we've been chatting with you uh, in, in, on this one of this Potter conference. So I believe that this whole program really started from him reading your papers. So you're kind of a father of this, of this whole business. But of course, if you add some topological terms to the action, then these boundary terms become different. Other question? Uh, yeah, I have a question. So uh, I understand that lambda can uh, have an arbitrary sign here, right? Yes. Uh, okay, so I think that in in the asymptotically deciter space times, you usually find that those charges that you define as uh, uh, in such a way that uh, the variation is given by a symplectic formula, they are not integrable. Uh, that that's uh, yeah. you, uh, well. As, well, the problem with asymptotic charge. Well, I, I'm not really using the asymptotic charges here. And in fact, in the asymptotic, in the asymptotic charges that, that we ever calculated were the in the case of ADS. What what I'm really looking about the, the local region, and I'm I, I'm perfectly I'm perfectly aware of the fact that if you actually uh, there might be some problems with especially in the sitter. Uh, when you when you st start constructing these charges because the uh, because the infinity structure is completely different than for okay. ADS for ADS it actually works. Okay. But it, so so thank you for the comment. I, I will I will have to think about it. But it's not it, it's not really it, 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 it's not really surprises. Uh, so it doesn't surprise me very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there questions? Uh, uh, so uh, I have a question. Uh, Jurek, yes, please. Jurek, you ask or not? Jurek, suspend it. I see. Dr. Ego Jurka movie. Lewandowski, because Lewandowski oh. showed up, but but he kind, he's kind of frozen, so I don't know. Yes, yes. So, so now I'm back. Okay, so How you, do you know I want, to, I want to say something? Do you read in my mind? Yes. 
We do. Oh, okay. We don't, we don't <laughs> uh, well, I just wanted to make a, a, a technical comment that this formula which you gave, which you say is magic formula for, for Hamiltonians obtained from um, contraction of symplectic form with, with symmetry, and they, it is valid if, if we have a, a full Cauchy surface. On the other hand, if you introduce some boundaries, um, uh, then, then in fact, this, uh, this formula is, is, doesn't work anymore. So, so uh, the, the, this uh, right-hand side doesn't define a, a closed variation of some, of some Hamiltonian. And then you have to add some uh, correction term from the boundary. Oh, that's a that's a very that's a very good comment. I, 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 I would love, it's part, I would love it's to part of your program, but maybe viewed in a different way. Uh, I, I guess I guess it's it's uh, I, I I guess it's uh, it, it might be so, but but I would love to discuss it further with you. Uh, of course, for the for the charges that we have computed, we actually check it explicitly that uh, that this form gives you the the total variation. So, uh, so, so in but this but case. Maciej Kolanowski is telling me that he said that he just made this comment, but, but sorry, as you notice, I was, I was disconnected for a few seconds for, 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 for a minute and, and that's why I probably missed Maciek's uh, comment. Yeah, so, so I, I, I think it would be, well, he, he, he actually commented that there might be some, there are some difficulties in the case of others asymptotically the city space. And I understand that you actually wrote some paper about it pretty lately, right? Uh, and if you have any any occasion to discuss it further, I would love to. Other questions? I, I have a question to first very naive question. Are these bulk equations equivalent to the Einstein equation? Yeah, they are exactly Einstein's equation, yes. Okay, so I, I'm happy because uh, Se second, uh, second question, if you use this vector V mm -hmm. in the Sitter algebra, uh, perhaps, uh, so, and to break symmetry in this way, why don't you add a dynamical term with, uh, with this field V like a six model for? <laughs> oh, that, that's, yeah, yeah, well, you can, you, yes, you can do it. Uh, 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 there, there is a paper, yes, there is an old paper of, of Smolin and Starodubtsev in which they investigated it. Yeah, so, so, so you just wanted to make it in dynamically like a kind of a, uh, like a kind of um, mm, a spontaneous symmetry breaking, right? So, yeah. so, you, so, so it actually breaks to some, well, uh, yes, uh, yes. Uh, well, the, 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 my criticism, so, so it was done, of course. Yes, I mean, there is this paper, you can dig it up, the paper by Smolin and Starodup, uh, Starodup, but, I think uh, it's 2004, 2005. But, they exactly did it. My problem with this is that uh, you see, with the, the Higgs mechanism, in the Higgs mechanism, the essential part of the Higgs mechanism is that you, the bottom of this potential is actually the, the lowest energy state. And it actually makes perfect sense in the case of quantum field theory. However, here I can, of course, add the potential, but then I, I have no reason to believe that there is anything special or physically distinguished by the minimum of the potential, because you know I, I, I really don't understand, don't don't know the, what, what is the physical meaning of energy in this system, right? So, so of course you can add this kind of a term, uh, but then you know I, I, I have no, I, I don't see any physical reason why this uh, so-called Higgs field is to sit in the bottom of the potential. Okay. So uh, this is not a good way to, uh, <clears throat> uh, to find a new <clears throat> particle of uh, co cosmological well, you, 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 you could, well, if you have an idea, it would be great. Actually, I never find any, I, I, I was thinking about it, but I never find any idea that came to me uh, convincing enough to actually to actually consider them seriously. Okay. <laughs> Some other questions. So, so maybe um, as a comment, you, you know, this last term in DF theory uh, it originates from the McDowell Manzuri construction, and uh, that's something we know from the seventies. And 
it has a really nice uh, way of contributing to Einstein Cartan action in the sense that it regularizes um, nether charges when you calculate it uh, for ADS, especially this infinity. Uh, mm, uh, it really works quite well. And uh, you might maybe see some works about the symmetry breaking mechanisms in Magdal Manzuri type, uh, because it's, it's really ex, uh, exploiting in this Friedel uh, Starodupsev small in action. Oh, yeah. good, good, good that you mentioned this. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's what, thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the, there is one message about it. I mean, one of the one of the reasons I, I should have said that one of the reasons why why I think this formulation is actually pretty nice is that if you calculate the charges at infinity in asymptotically ADS case, you find that they're finite automatically. Usually, when you calculate charges in the asymptotically ADS, uh, people find that it's a necessity to do some renormalization because the charges were divergent. But in our case, in our case, uh, in our case is actually they are perfectly finite due to this particular combination bound of these topological terms, which is kind of a mystery why it happens, but it does happen. So it really produces very nice charges, very, very very nice finite charges in uh, as, uh, which are asymptotically finite. So, so in, in details, when you would like to calculate, for example, mass uh, just for Einstein Cartan action, you will get like mass over two and some divergence due to the cosmological constant term. Uh, and basically, this uh, Euler term, uh, which is just like curvature, curvature, and, and epsilon. It provides you this missing, uh, because it plays the role of boundary term, in, uh, this uh, mass over two and minus this divergence you had over there. And we found that, for example, in uh, Holst situation is the same for Pontragin doing the same thing, but it's not visible for uh, plenty of solutions that we found, for example, the Staub nut case is the like, I mean, the only case you can actually see contribution. And for example, I found that you get this dual mass out of that. And surprisingly, it's not so simple in the way, like here, mass over this dual mass over two, but it's uh, with cosmological constant, actually, it's not equal contribution, but altogether, it gives you really nice uh, value of this uh, dual charge, uh, dual mass uh, in, in the Staubnat. So. Mm -hmm. That's also worth to, to, to see. So at least we could uh, see that, for example, our, our definition of charges give us uh, really uh, good answers, let's say, for, for the standard cases for einstein Cartan, but the, the whole, this uh, not uh, solution actually uh, just shows this Holst and Pontragin contribution actually non-zero. Uh, and uh, that's also kind of nice and... Uh, but still, it's very hard to understand this uh, meaning, the, the interpretation of charges. Because, for example, we notice something which reminds um, like angular momenta, because basically we're getting like a mass times this uh, dual mass, and then it looks just like mass times uh, Kerr uh, um, parameter. So it's also worth to 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 know this. Uh, strange behavior, but it's not really due to our construction, it's due to the, <clears throat> the construction of action, which, which gives us. Some other questions or comments? Okay, if not, uh, thank you very much again. It was very interesting. Also, the discussion was interesting. So I thank everybody, but if you 